Good morning and welcome to the FSR webinar entitled The Introduction to Capacity Mechanisms, Market Failure and Mechanism Design that will be presented today by Carlos Batlier, Associate Research Professor at Comillas University in Madrid, Electricity Advisor at Florence School of Regulation and the MIT Visiting Scholar. My name is Magdalena Mosha and I'm a training coordinator at Florence School of Regulation. And before we will connect to our today's speaker, I would like to point out just a couple of points regarding the webinar agenda. So the first point is the introduction. So this is exactly what I'm doing right now. In this point, I will also briefly explain the control panel that you can see right now on the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we will proceed with the presentation of Carlos Batlier. And then we will be able to proceed to the Q&A section. In this section, our today's speaker will answer for questions submitted by the audience. And how to do that, I will explain briefly in just a couple of seconds. Then we will be able to conclude this webinar with some final announcements. Okay, so this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. So uh, there are a couple of features that I would like to explain just uh, very briefly right now. So the first one is to close or, or to open the panel. So this is this orange arrow that you can see um, in the panel. So if you would like to follow the webinar by having the presentation on your full computer screen, just please click here and the control panel will remain on your computer screen but will be minimized. However, if you would like to reopen the panel, just please click in the same place. There is another option. So if you would like to check uh, something in the internet or you would like to do something on your computer, just please click uh, in the bottom just below. It, this is to minimize the window. It means that the webinar icon will still remain on your taskbar and you will be able to come back to it uh, whenever you wish. However, I strongly encourage you to close programs such as Skype because this can interfere with the internet connection and in result also the quality of this webinar. The next button is the hand rise tool. This is the place where um, where I would like you to use just right now because if you can hear me right now and if you can see the presentation, just please click on this button here and I will know that everything is fine and that we can proceed with uh, the webinar. Okay, I can see that you are clicking. Everything seems to be fine. However, if you have any problems with um, technical problems during the webinar or you would like to submit questions to our today's speaker, just please use the question box that you can see just here below. And uh, Carlos Batia will try to answer for as many questions as possible at the end of this webinar. Okay, so now it's the moment, almost the moment, to, to connect with our today's speaker. And just before I will do that, I would like to briefly uh, explain his background. So Carlos began working on capacity mechanisms in the late 90s, and since then he has worked on this issue for many regulatory institutions in many countries. And recently he has been advising the UK DEC on this issue, and right now he is in Lima in Peru. Uh, advising the Peruvian regulator, and I think that he is, uh, well, basically he is the only person awake in Lima right now. Uh, so let's just connect to Carlos and see whether he can hear us or whether everything is fine. Carlos, can you hear me? Oh uh, yes, I can. I hope that anyway it was uh, yes. I can hear you perfectly. Very, perfect. I'm okay. very happy. Okay. So I hope okay. everybody is, uh, can listen to me. Yes, I can hear you. So I will right now connect to your computer screen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being here and for being awake. And uh, so please proceed with your presentation, and I will speak to you again in around 45 minutes. Good luck. Okay. Thank you very much, Magda, for uh, this uh, nice introduction. Uh, just let me tell you one thing. Uh, maybe that is a good illustration of what we're going to talk about. The reason why I'm in Lima today, it's just because currently now, uh, as uh, most of you probably know, that in Peru the market is liberalized. So there's a different from the European case, but there's a market uh, implemented already. 
and the government has one main concern now uh, that has to do with the lack of investment on hydro reservoirs and hydro plants. And after making some analysis and planning, and they have got to the conclusion that the right investment to be done in the Peruvian market is the, are these plants. But for some reason, the market is not pr providing investors with the right incentives to do it. So now they are facing the situation in which they want to analyze which kind of mechanisms or adjustments should be made into their market design so to facilitate or to remove, if you want to see from the other way, the barriers that are not are preventing these plants to enter the market. And this is not only a Latin American problem, as you probably know, is the, the British government is struggling with exactly more very similar problems. They have decided that the right investments to do are, for instance, nuclear plants, and for some reason the investors are are claiming that they need some kind of uh, public support in some way, either explicit or, or through regulation, to go towards these investments. This is the brief introduction that I wanted to make about it. Um, just let me tell you very briefly uh, which are the main contents of this seminar. I will begin with an introduction to this introductory seminar. Uh, then I will try to justify the reasons why in the current state of the, the situation uh, the mar real markets are not working as we would expect from the hypothetically of, you know, optimal ones in theory and then I will move to some regulatory alternatives that, are, that can be implemented and I will very quickly review which are the main design and questions design that have to be answered and uh, and I will try to close with some conclusions and um, with the interesting part of the Q&A in the end. So let's go quickly through that. Uh, one thing that we always do uh, after 15 years working on these issues before talking about the capacity mechanisms is to distinguish the different dimensions of the security of supply problem. We think that it's a very important thing because it's uh, decoupling this, the time in these different dimensions allows for applying very different solutions to the different problems, but also I want to illustrate to you all how in each one of these dimensions the intervention of the regulator is currently present at all levels. So it's not that capacity markets are a bad thing because they are intervening in the market as if it wouldn't happen in any other sector. Now there are <coughs> sorry dimension related to core systems. So let's go with it. Talking first about, uh, just about management of generation, you can decouple the time scales of, of this business, the generation activity in different time frames, uh, distinguished from the very long term, so the strategic expansion dimension, as we call it, in which the system or the operation has to deal with what would the system will look like in 30 years' time or something like that. We move to the expansion of the system, so which is the uh, which are the decisions that have to be made in the long term, so which is the investment to be made in five or, or no longer than ten years' time. Uh, then once we deal with the plants that are already installed in the system, which are which is the way that they have to be managed, so how to deal with the fuels, the gas contracts and other things, and finally the operation dimension in which we deal with the very technical security issues uh, of the networks and the generation with it. Just to, to mention very quick examples on these dimensions, a pilot CCS plant would be one example of a decision making in the SOG expansion uh, view. Uh, the investment in a CCS plant it would be more oriented in the uh, what we call expansion dimension. Planning would be the high risk of our management or take of a contracts or any sort of uh, fuel management of this one. And finally, operation is everything that has to do with ancillary services, reserves, and all these kinds of things. Then on, on, uh, on top of these, say, more technical issues, we can add our regulatory solutions. And um, this is what we give different names to these different dimensions. So we have the, for the very long term, the strategic expansion policy that we will discuss later. Um, we will deal with adequacy for capacity expansion. We have, we made a lot of emphasis in the, on the importance of 
experience dimension, so what to do to make the best of the existing plants in the system so that they are oriented to world the security supply in an efficient way. And finally, we name as security everything that has to do after gate closure in the market, so all these service, 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 secondary markets we work on. So which is the major question that I want to deal with is, in each one of these dimensions, which is the right level of intervention, if any, that the regulator has to uh, make? And uh, you can see that the alternatives will be from no intervention to really strong intervention and everything in between. So it's a great gray scale of the different alternatives. And in particular, we will face that question in the different ones. I am going to introduce very briefly, which is the uh, already uh, existing intervention in the uh, at both ends in the strategic expansion policy and security one and then the center of the webinar will be focused on the two dimensions in between which is everything that has to do with attracting capacity uh, new capacity to the system the adequacy ones and also uh, being sure that this capacity that comes into the system is the one is the one that is needed and uh, that provides the most efficient uh, contribution to the system, for instance, flexibility if we expect for a lot of renewables in the system. So beginning, uh, before beginning with this, I wanted to just uh, leave an open question for you all in order to see a little bit which is your view on which is the level of the regulatory intervention in these different dimensions. And therefore, my question for you all would be, what do you think is being done in practice? So in the markets in which generation activity has been supposedly very large currently now, the markets you know, in which dimension do you think the regulators intervene currently now in the large extent? In which one is one of the things? So make your, give your opinions and we will comment them uh, right afterwards. I hope that you are here ready. Okay. And I see the answers moving fast. And changing fast, by the way. Uh, well, one thing that um, I will stop it when 50% of the people has voted. Okay, so I, maybe I will be able to skip the next question because it's it's great to see that there is not a consensus with this, and I will show it to you now. I'm going to close it. There you go. So you can see the results here. And surprisingly, uh, well, you see that, that there is not a consensus on the different levels of intervention in different dimensions. One thing that I really, uh, agree with you all is that the weakest point is is the firmness one. So, but. Uh, one important thing that I would like, I wanted to illustrate from your results is that contrary to what has been usually expected, the intervention of the, or usually said, the intervention of the regulator is present everywhere, at all levels, in different formats. So talking about capacity mechanisms is something that is not new. So markets in electricity lead together with uh, intervention at all levels. Uh, and uh, this is something that I like that our audience today has very clear uh, so exactly with it. I will go very quickly on on talking look at this question. What is how this intervention is implemented? What's a security of supply mechanism, talking in a broad sense? It's something that mainly means that uh, uh, the regulator decides that it's good for demand to buy something that is not buying. So the regulator thinks that there's something that he knows, he, she, it knows better than demand what should be done. And what it, it decides to buy something on behalf of demand or uh, ask demand to buy for certain time scale that relates with the dimension we've seen. And what, they, what the regulator decides to buy is an administratively defined product, something that might be something green or installed or available or fast or whatever. Um, this is uh, the point that uh, I wanted to, to make. Let me see, because when we go to the call for some reason, my computer needs me to move to the next uh, slide using the uh, second line. Sorry for this. Uh, let me see. That I cannot 
move my ah, okay, we got it. So talking on the bubble tents very quickly, uh, which is the intervention at the security dimension in the short term? You already know uh, secondary markets are usually centralized by the transmission system operators, the ISOs in the United States. The system operators define which are the quantities for the share that have to be bought by uh, demand or, or have to be bought in these markets. Uh, they also add rules that are not market-based, like the dual imbalance pricing rules in the, in the European Union, in which no matter which way you deviate for your program, you are penalized even if you're helping the system. There are many rules in that, in that sense. On the strategy expansion policy, let's go to the very long term, the obvious one, renewable subsidies in the form of feeding tariffs in which the regulator sets an administrative, an administrative price for bringing in a one particular kind of technology or what I call colored certificates, brown certificates, the CO2 permits, or grid certificates, or white certificates for any efficiency in which, again, the regulator decides a quantity of something that the market should buy or, or trade, and then uh, price appears. And also, uh, there are other not so green uh, subsidies that are national coast subsidies uh, to support, for instance, the coal industry in one particular country. Uh, in Spain, as you, some of you know, we are experts on this kind of things. Um, great. So let's go to the problem diagnosis. So what I'm going to try to focus now is on this firmness and adequacy dimensions, and I will try to justify why um, capacity mechanisms might be needed. And, uh, and then I will specify a little bit the discussion in the recent this, um, situation in which the advent of lots of renewables is, might be might take place. Right? Um, this is a little bit to make it, to scare you a little bit, but just very quickly and uh, is just to say that ideally for good economists, uh, the market is the solution that solves every problem. And it's the right the right design that warranties that that efficiency is maximized, that uh, the market agents by trading and dealing uh, in the short and long term uh, are is, are the ones that might assure that the not only that the market the generation uh, mix is being optimized in the short term and it's being dispatched efficiently, but also that this efficiency and this optimization in the short term and this marginal price in the short term warranty the, the optimal mix in the long term. And there are some equations that you have there that uh, if anybody wants to freak out a little bit, I, uh, we can do something about it in another moment. So I, I, would, I would just skip this uh, situation by saying that unfortunately, or fortunately, you never know, uh, real life is different. Um, all these uh, theories, marginal pricing theory, is based on a number of very, uh, well, uh, lots of hypotheses that are summarized there. So these hypotheses consist of first that uh, the theories are assuming that the short-term price is efficient, so the short-term market works perfectly, there's a competitive demand participation, there's a competitive generation participation, there's an efficient pricing rule. Also, the long-term market is working efficiently and the risk is properly being allocated among the different agents, so uh, this moves uh, or uh, provides market agents with incentives to trade in the long term by also linking their views in the short term. And that there are other issues like continuous investments and no economies of scale on itself. So, so we will go very quickly to justify that any of these hypotheses by far uh, is not working in any real life market for a number of reasons. Talking about competitive participation, needless to say that yet for, I, I'm not going to enter in the, in the reasons why this happens, but it's certainly true that for the moment demand is not setting the price. In many countries there are still price caps that are uh, that are affecting the price formation. Um, there's also there are also uh, intervention of the of the uh, OS uh, uh, in this way of, for instance, affecting when there are scarcities in the frequency of the system. This is a common use in the U.S. Or 
uh, also the, in some countries the, the system operator um, uh, I'm talking about the system operator, sorry, not the, uh, the, the SO. Uh, the system operator signs interruptible contracts with uh, industrials that uh, are expected, they, they resort to when their scarcity is, is closed, but the problem with this is that these contracts don't set the price of the demand, so price uh, is uh, artificially lower than what it would be if this industrial or, or these consumers would be bidding in the market as demand response. Uh, competitive generation participation, there are offer caps in many countries, just to name one here in Peru, gas plants are bidding a lower price than what uh, that would be the market price because they are buying the gas from the public company and the public company is trying to sell this gas to this, these generators at a lower price so that the electricity is lower. There are entry barriers, vertical integration issues, and I you have a good discussion of Ofgen in the UK. Um, the fish pricing rule is also that another thing was problems at the quotas not convex, and there are uh, discussions on whether these uh, cycling costs, this startup cost of the plant, thermal plants with a lot of renewables are being priced properly in the markets, and this is another discussion on the long term. I'm going to the long term. We know that the um, Risk is allocated efficiently. Uh, certainly, generators are risk covers. This is something that the marginal pricing theory didn't count on. And, and the problem also is that most consumers are not risk covers. They should be, but they think that, well, the regulator will help them to some extent to avoid that problem. Just to go fast to this, just to give you one example of the many of the, the hypotheses we're talking about that it might be a little bit interesting. Talking about risk, there you have two profiles of the prices in two Latin American markets uh, in which they have a lot of hydro resources. As you can see on the left side, you have the prices in Brazil from 2000 to 2009, and as you can see, for four or five years, prices were close to zero uh, in long periods of time, but also they have been very high in some cases. Same thing for Colombia. So usually the problem that the investors have is that this is this long-term risk is very large. So they are struggling to find um, financing for, for instance, backup plants for these situations on gas or, or thermal conventional thermal plants because of these risks. This is something that justifies and for, for the European, um, for, sorry, for Latin American uh, regulator has always justified the need for any capacity mechanisms. So I will have one question on the latest in Europe now on the U.S., which would be related to short-term price volatility risk intermittency. The question is, you have heard in many countries that the short-term uh, price risk volatility due to renewables is affecting future investments. So I would like, would like to ask your opinion on that issue. I would like to, to ask you if you think that this is right. So if this intermittency and short-term volatility would, uh, will require that the regulator implements uh, capacity mechanisms, if it's a real uh, um, argument in favor of capacity mechanisms or not. And I will try to be a little bit polemic with this. Uh, uh, let me learn. There you have it. Easy to answer. And I see from the very beginning that this um, certain majority consensus on the topic. Okay. So as you can see now, and I just close. This is like able to share with you. This is something that is creating a problem while 30% doesn't. Uh, I must say that I agree with the nay, no answer for the following reason. Uh, it's just that when we talk about intermittency, we're talking about um, renewables and, and changes when we move to the one. 
we're talking about profiles, price profiles like the one you're seeing there. These are the prices that you that are that occur in the Spanish market. As you know, one of the world champions in wind generation last month, in some hours of the day, 60% of the generation was having wind origin. And you see the price in the first quarter in 2010. In this quarter, there were 331 zero prices in the market. But at the same time, you can see that also they were they were together with very high prices in the same days. So my point is that when we talk about capacity mechanisms, we're talking about the long term. And the problem that we currently have now is not this, the expected short-term price volatility, but the mistrust of investors on the ability of the, general, of the um, regulator to respect the market signals or to really know what is going to happen in the future. So once the, the uh, investor would know which is the amount of wind that they will have and, and which would be this, the characteristics of, this, of these technologies, they would, no problem, they will invest. But they will have to trust that the regulator would allow to have 1,000 euros or $100,000 prices in some cases after, for instance, three days of very low prices. And they will have to trust that the regulator would not change the generation mix in a number of years later, aiming to other any other objectives, and these are the points that are more long-term oriented. So, yes, renewables are, are a factor, a risk factor for the need of capacity mechanism, but not due to the price patterns, but due to the uncertainty uh, of regulator decision. Just to illustrate a little bit, we come from a print vanilla scenario, very simple, in which the discussion was about nuclear plants, coal plants, and uh, gas plants. And now, uh, now we have lots of uncertainties, like wind, solar, um, interconnections, batteries, electric vehicles, um, smart meters, demand response, CO2 constraints. And this is what really, in my view, is threatening investors to make decisions. So finally, what, what, what does the regulator uh, need to do now? And, it seems they are taking the central planner role again by deciding the amount of renewables to be implemented in the system. Uh, to some extent, uh, if there is a certain need of, of adding this long-term views of the regulator in the support for capacity expansions. Um, so the, uh, the objective in the other the other question that I mentioned is to more or less point the market where is the direction in which the regulator wants to go and to help the investors in that dimension. And also, by after doing that, trying to guarantee that in this new scenario, they will be able to bring in generation that will be the one, the flexible one, the right one that will be good one for reacting to these new price patterns, right? There is a point important there, which is, some questions I will leave open uh, for these uh, mechanisms uh, in the sense of saying that uh, all this support should be awarded to the new uh, plants only, to existing ones. It depends on the particular of each market. Uh, should we have to involve the renewables in these mechanisms or not? They should, have a different, should they have a different life? How do we assess availability? So when do we need, how do we know when we want to reward some new capacity coming that which are the characteristics, what do we want from them, um, how do we provide the generators with incentives to maximize availability in those periods that we don't know how to define, should we plan penalties, there are many questions. And one important question, very relevant question in the European Union, how do we deal with foreign generating units, should we allow the French generating unit bidding in the, in the market, in the long term capacity market in the UK or the other way around, should, allow, should we allow in France to do it, uh, 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 UK generating unit, these are very hot topics currently. Now on the demand side, how do we in introduce demand in these discussions? In, the, in England, uh, there have been a very good uh, work there uh, to achieve the same. How do we evaluate the future contribution on any efficiency problems, how do we allocate the long-term capacity mechanism customers among consumers who pays for that, 
uh, in regional markets, for instance, as it was the case, for instance, in the middle, how do we, if we are adding more money in, the, in, in place and generating units are going to be installed no matter in which country, how do we play with these tariffs or how do we assign these different um, costs among industrial consumers and households and all these kinds of things. So one comment that I think is brilliant from George Bush uh, that has to do with that is uh, the one you see there. So the question is that if we have to abandon free market principles to save the free market system. Um, Bush was talking about this in a slightly different context, talking about the financial crisis, but the situation is very similar. Um, and I think it's a uh, very clear uh, comment. So quickly on regulator alternatives in the last uh, five minutes. There are two choices, obviously. One is to do nothing, is just to wait and see, let the market learn by doing, by doing or to do something, right? Very introductory, if doing something means, again, that the regulator buys or orders the demand to buy a product, something, energy capacity, something. Uh, the regulator defines the counterparties, who has to buy. It's just households or low voltage consumers. It's all demand. It's the system. Uh, who uh, is allowed to sell? It's just the all the generation in the system, the existing one and the new ones, just the new entrants or both, uh, but with different price formations. Uh, how to define the bidding curve? How to define the, the way to buy that uh, that, that uh, new product through an auction or through a, a capacity payment or, or just bilaterally in a capacity market? We will we'll go ahead and very quickly through that. Let me just uh, make you one question on something that I've, we've been fighting for 15 years because you've been here given that there are lots of energy only markets around the globe and, uh, and uh, since we were working with this uh, in the past everybody was saying that you you work a lot on capacity mechanisms because you don't trust the market and uh, there are many other places in which the market is showing that it's working with other intervention. So um, my question would be for you is uh, according to your uh, your view, how many markets do you know or do you think that are truly energy only markets? So uh, uh, here I will launch the poll. And any energy marks mean that the means that the regulator doesn't intervene in any way. Um, so let me be able to launch this. Okay. So in your view, Talking about adequacy, right, which um, would be uh, the question. And I see that there's a great consensus, so I'm going to close it and then share it with you. Uh, there you have that uh, there's a lot of uh, very pessimistic audience among us. So uh, most of you think that there's less than five that are, that are um, thinking that, that there are not energy only markets. I would say, I was thinking when I designed this poll to add another option which would be none. But I thought maybe I could hurt the feelings of somebody. But I would almost think that indeed it's none. That, that for some one reason or another, or another, sorry, uh, finally in reality there are no, no explicit, strictly speaking these cases. Very quickly. Things that are done in some so-called energy only markets are the regulator purchasing in advance reserves that are not always um, looking just short-term security objectives. There are many countries in which the generator or the retailers are state-owned, so they are really concerned about security supply and they fix their problem. You have some examples there. Uh, there are also these out-of-the-market controls with interruptible loads in many countries. Uh, for instance, in Alberta and ERCOT or in Spain, in ERCOT with the oil companies in the south of the states. Uh, so it's very difficult to find a real market that is deal with this only, uh, without any sort of intervention. This is my point. So when it comes to go to do something, what is the objective of regulators? It's just to track capacity, to guarantee an efficient resource, resource management. Also, there are other secondary objectives that it should be, they should be dealt with care because sometimes they 
complicate and, and add patches, unnecessary patches to the regulation, which is to stabilize prices in the future. So be able to avoid these very high price spikes with some kind of financial options. This is a lot of the options mechanisms that we, we designed back in 98 in Colombia. And there's another secondary objective, which is mitigate entry barriers. So try to facilitate the advent of new investors into the system to try to break a little bit any potential vertical integration that might be in place. Uh, very quickly, what do the generators want? Mainly to hedge risk, to facilitate finance, project finance. Uh, um, well, but uh, also, uh, to some extent, we have to bear with the idea that uh, if the market is not working efficiently, maybe we need to pay some more money in order to achieve the same. So it might look a little bit more expensive in the beginning. Talking very quickly on the design uh, elements of the product and leaving open some of the 1,000 questions that have to be there when designing this kind of capacity or mechanisms. We can have different products. The, the product can be physical capacity, so the name capacity, or just what we think is firm. Let me give you a quick example, which is the actual capacity that we should be allowed or recognized to award it to a windmill or to a hydro plant that has different uh, hydro availabilities. Uh, it can be energy, so the energy available in the hydro reservoir. In New Zealand, they, they set uh, research that the minimum research that had to be respected and generators are paid for that or it can be an, just an energy contract which is just uh, the, might be also physical so the need of having the plant producing at one particular time or uh, more issues on the product the different time scales or time terms the lag period so we should allow some time for the plants to be built uh, and then how long should we warranty this this incentive? Uh, just to name one, in Brazil, this contract duration is about 15 years, and the lag period, the time to build them, usually is like five or seven. This would be uh, one example of that. Uh, penalization, so what do we do if the generator finally uh, doesn't complain with the commitment? The larger the penalization is expected, the larger the price of this capacity and the larger the premiums to be paid. And warranties also, uh, how do we warranty that the unit is being paid stuff? And I'm going to finish some more on who should be the buyer and the seller. So it's all the demand, it's just part of it. How do we deal with cost subsidies, with free riding? Uh, who is allowed to sell? So uh, in some countries, the regulator is choosing among different technologies, so it's really retaking the central plant role, or just adding some handicaps as the banding provisions in, in for renewables. Uh, how do we purchase that, that new product through uh, setting a price like a feeding tariff and, or a capacity payment and allowing for waiting to see if with this price generation is happy and generation comes, or setting a quantity and allowing for a cap and trade market like uh, capacity markets in the US or the apparently the proposal that is being done in France or an option uh, that is what is implemented in Colombia or New England and is being discussed recently in the UK. Um, just to finish because I want to leave some time for the questions is just to leave the idea that, that in principle, markets will provide, and, and uh, I like economists a lot because they're brilliant people, but suddenly uh, real life spoils good economic theories, uh, economical theories, and political issues, uh, and all these kind of sort of things. Some intervention is needed, and the main thing are the details. And designing these kind of mechanisms is certainly uh, a real challenge. So. Uh, I wanted to finish now, so I have we have still some small time for questions. I would ask Magda to stop me once uh, it's time to close because we are going to stick to the one hour commitment. Uh, and I will take a look at the questions. So I will try to answer to the questions you have been leaving here. Uh, and I hear sorry for that because they are very. Uh,
long ones. Yes, Ca Carlos, I will stop you in the right time, so, so don't worry. I know that the questions are quite long. I would just encourage our participants to submit the questions now. Okay, and I already have one, some of them, but the, some of you have sent really uh, long ones. <laughs> but, but anyway, and also, uh, is it possible to download? I, I see that you, in the questions, you have had lots of uh, uh, comments. Okay, so one is, Carlos is right to say that capacity mechanisms is uh, not related to short-term price volatility but more to long-term investment. Um, do you think that a regulator government can give stability uh, you are asking for? This is a very good question. I don't know. I think they should. Uh, and I think the European Commission is trying to do that. Um, but certainly, this is the key. So, how do we do that? Uh, I say my claim is, is that the record gets to the conclusion that it's not possible to do that. There is not possible to provide investor with this stability, what they have to recognize then is that they need to some extent, to some extent, add this conventional thermal generation into the, the same treatment. So they have to somehow uh, hedge this risk, this uncertainty for, for investors if they, if they want to avoid uh, scarcity in the future. So uh, I, I can understand that it's a little bit frustrating also for me and for, for all of us that we've been working with this, that we expect that the market were going to be the solution, but it's better to recognize that for the moment it's not the best solution and try to fix it at least as a transitory measure and then better than, than just uh, thinking that the market will be able to do it and get into a worse uh, solution. Uh, I think that this is what is going on, for instance, in the UK recently where uh, it's a new, uh, new thing. Uh, another one comment is, I agree that efficient signals should omit the need for a capacity mechanism, but in the main concern around the frequency and probability in this quote in the price spike, similar to food, uh, isn't this wine built conventional generator need a capacity mechanism? Well, the thing, this is one of the discussions that are very active in the United States, for instance, in, in air coding text. So, um, there is a, there's a lot about trust collisions. So, again, short-term volatility would not be a problem. Uh, the only thing that we could expect is that, as I said before, we would have lots of zero prices, but also some a significant number of $1,000 euros prices. And if we could believe that a regulator would be able to bear these situations and nothing would happen and no intervention would occur, maybe we wouldn't need this capacity mechanism. This is the philosophy that has been implemented in Texas recently, for instance, and my complaint when I'm there to those guys is that I don't trust that they will be able to resist the temptation of intervening in the market if something wrong happens. And it's not the problem of of believing that this will not happen is that uh, for the regulator, the regulator can swear to God that they will not intervene. <laughs> investors usually don't trust on that. And no, they don't trust on that because they've seen that they analyze the California crisis, they've analyzed the Ontario crisis in Canada where when high prices appear, the regulator intervene in the market. So there are plenty of examples in which the regulator intervene in the market with very high prices arrive. This didn't happen, for instance, in Sweden and in other countries in 2000, and in the beginning of the 2000s. But again, uh, in, in, in those countries, uh, the retailers are, in most cases, municipalities, and they were, to some extent, signing long-term contracts to hedge against that. And also, the Nordic countries, which I love, are different from the rest of the world. They are really smart leaders. But anyway, there is kind of... Uh, uh, Safe net, which is the uh, the um, public owned uh, retailers that to some extent help to do the solving the problem. Might it be 
Sarah Schwein of a capacity mechanism has less distortional impact on the energy market and other designs? Yes, obviously. Uh, in, for instance, a capacity, price, a capacity payment in which we set the price, it intervenes more uh, than, for instance, uh, quantity mechanism in which we have a capacity market and we define which is the objective capacity and then we let the market to set this price. But at the same time, I, I might say that I cannot answer to that question without knowing the specific issues that relate with each particular market. So one important message that I would like to send after working in more than 10 countries is that no, there are no two markets that are the same. Uh, and each particular market has lots of differences. So uh, I would say that when implementing a, this kind of mechanism, one should try to minimize the intervention. But uh, the, there's no one single solution that, that fits all. And I wouldn't, I, obviously, I, I like um, reliability options or how uh, the way the British call them market-wide capacity mechanisms to a centralized option. Why? Because I think that is a good uh, alternative first to avoid free riding, so all the demand should pay for that because all is benefiting from bringing in these new capacities because I think it's a good way to remove a little bit or at least try to remove entry barriers to the market so new entrants, it's easy for them to find counterparties with centralized option while in a very vertically integrated market it's difficult for new entrants to find for consumers to sign these long-term contracts and, um, and well I think that they have also worked very well in the US uh, allowing for lots of demand response to enter into the system because they have time enough to prepare all the needs that they have to uh, the equipment and facilities to, to provide also with reliability and I think that this is the, the option I like best but I'm not a Taliban with that. So, so I've been many countries advising uh, different things depending on the particularities of the, of the system. Um, Another option of for doing some, what role do you think marginal pricing that prices in locational differences in capacity and market source nodal pricing and stuff? Um, I think that obviously this is uh, something that after spending a lot of time in the U.S., uh, you might think that I'm biased to that alternative, but certainly I think this would be a great thing to be implemented. I know that in Europe is something that we can expect for a different reason, for different reasons, but obviously it will be really helpful. But I would say that nodal pricing would be a good choice uh, for the short-term market price formation, but I don't think it's so easy to implement in the long term. <clears throat> if this is the case, I, I think that this might be solved not with a capacity mechanism, but rather with locational signals through the transmission tariffs or any other solution in that way while leaving this capacity mechanisms open uh, and with a single node uh, criteria. Um, in the cost context of this new security model, is there any suitable one solution fits all markets? No, again, no, I <laughs> said so already. There is no one solution. Has to be, and this is great for the people like uh, like me that works in this. Uh, so there's always changing situations, and it depends a lot on how, which are the different points of view, what the regulator is thinking, what is going to do, uh, and each particular country is different. The market structures are different. In some countries, there are huge um, national champions, take France for instance. In others. Uh, there's uh, only private companies, that is the case in the UK. In other markets, they have hydro facilities or, or regional markets, so uh, it is not the same thing to deal with, with Portugal, which are interconnected, that, that with um, isolated market like Ireland. So uh, fortunately, there is not one single solution. Is there really the need of capacity markets? Well, I think that it is. Sorry for, um, would you propose a na national approaches or should we go for one European mechanism if we go for it? Great question. Um, I've been claiming recently that one of the biggest burdens for the internal market for electricity in the European Union is that 
while we are making a great effort on um, harmonizing harmonizing the short-term rules, um, there is there is a lack of coordination on all the different capacity mechanisms that are being implemented. Today. So uh, the UK is going towards uh, looks like that is going towards a centralized ca uh, auction, while uh, France has announced a bilateral market uh, in which the objective is to produce when uh, the temperatures are very high uh, and they are not allowing explicitly uh, foreign generating units to bid into these bilateral markets. In Spain we have an in and out uh, hide and seek capacity market payment that they put it, they take it out and they, they don't know what to do with them. Italy has announced something for 2017. So all these different designs might be hampering the future coordination of the European market. And I think that the European Commission or Acer or somebody like that should do something quickly to try to at least, one might think that different mechanisms could be implemented, but uh, it would be very important that at least it would be sort of warranty that, that we have a, a coordinated market in the future, so we are not uh, opening and coordinating the markets in the short term, closing them for in the future. And um, do you see uh, if there are any problems with capacity mechanism that has different contract durations this, uh, for existing and new plants? This is also a very hot topic, how to deal with the different plants, not only on contract durations, but also on participation participating in the markets if they can they have to be price takers or not or, or the, if they should be paid or not so in some countries like Brazil the existing units don't are not paid for that while only the new ones in uh, Colombia uh, only the new ones are paid but the existing ones get the uh, are price takers or they get the price uh, I, I think that this is an open question again, and it depends specifically on the history and the part of each market. So I would not dare to give a broad. Uh, what I would say is that it's important to deal with this topic and to really think about that because there's also lots of discussions there on windfall profits and other things that, as you know, finally condition regulation sadly. Uh, I think this is something that should be dealt with. And uh, we're running out of time, but uh, yes, we are running out of time. Uh, how about capacity? Uh, yes, we are running out of okay, time. We so, have four uh, minutes left. I have to conclude. I'm sorry. What? Well, I'm sorry, Carlos. Unfortunately, I have to come back to my computer screen, and I have to conclude today's session. Mara, sorry to interrupt you. I hope that people were listening to me better than what I'm listening to you. Uh, I think that they heard you well. Until this point, I heard you well, so I think that people also could follow it correctly. Okay, so okay, I will sorry. just, yes. You close. I close. Thank you very much, Carlos, and I connect back to my computer screen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry for the, the lack of the quality of the connection. Okay, so now I will just come back to my computer screen just to conclude this session. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos, and we are sorry for these interruptions during the webinar. Well, you have to understand that there is an ocean between me and Carlos, and, and I know that you are also from many different countries all around the world, so this unfortunately can happen. And uh, just to conclude this session, I have just some final announcements. So. Uh, the first announcement is that automatically on your computer screen, after we will close this webinar, will appear this survey. The survey is consisted of eight questions, and uh, this, if you if you uh, fill out this questionnaire, this will help us to evaluate this session and make some improvements in the future. Please take into account that the connections problem. This is something that it's uh, that we don't have really control on. 
Okay, so the next webinar will take place on the 20th of June at 11 a.m. And the topic of this webinar is European Union involvement in electricity and natural gas transmission grid tarification. And the presenter of this webinar will be my colleague from Florence Corp Regulation, Sophia Rooster, the research assistant in the THINK project. And in order to register for this event, you can go directly right now to our website. And this is the home page of uh, FSR. So under the training section and the webinar section, there is the registration link already. And uh, keep in mind that tomorrow you will receive also a follow-up email from me where I will thank you for participating in this webinar. And you will also find the link to register for the next webinar there. And there will be also a link to download the PDF presentation from today's webinar and also to watch the recording uh, of today's session. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions regarding the future webinars or any technical issues, just please contact me by using the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. However, if you have any uh, questions regarding the content of today's presentation and, for instance, maybe your question wasn't answered during the Q&A section, please, please contact Carlos uh, by using the email that you can see just here below. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us today. I'm sorry once again for the interruptions. And, well, I hope that you will join us once again in June. And until then, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye.